Okay, hello everyone, welcome back to Bridging the Gap. Uh, today we're going to talk about the end game. And so I know this video seems a little out of open or a little out of order. Um, but as so it happens while writing the script outline for the middle game video, there were a couple of things I wanted to talk about that resulted it in it being too long. I don't really want to go more than 20 minutes long. So I knew I need to split that one. So while that process is taking place, I thought I'd go ahead and make this video on the end game first. Um, just to get some content out there. So, what is the end game? Well, the end game begins when the outlines of territory are pretty much set, and so there are no more really large plays to be made on the board. Uh, while end game moves are often small in point value, we're talking, you know, maybe a point or two at most. Uh, that doesn't mean that the end game isn't worth studying. Don't be mistaken there. Good end game makes up a lot of points or loses you a lot of points, and are often. Uh, is often the deciding factor in game outcomes. Um, so to give a quote from a professional, one Don professional Antti Tormanen in his book Rational Endgame states, uh, the endgame leaves space for a swing of up to 30 or 40 points. So you can imagine if a player really lacks endgame knowledge um, and they come out you know, like 20 points ahead going into endgame, but then they completely ruin the last 50 to 150 moves of the game, um, you know, they can lose and not by a little bit, we're talking by a big swing, again, where they lose by 10 to 20 points while having led by that much. Um, so the end game, it's first good to make clear, is a really, really precise area of study. So unlike the opening and the middle game, there's often um, only just one right path, right? Because these finite positions are on the board that we can count and we can measure the point values of, um, there is one correct path um, in any given endgame situation that will ultimately get you the most amount of points. Uh, and so move values can be calculated in really crazy ways, um, and you'll get sometimes absurd numbers like, you know, 148th, codes are worth a third of a point, but sometimes they're not. And so probably most people don't ever need to go that deep, and certainly not the double-digit Q level, which is, you know, kind of the target audience for this video. So here we're only going to focus on three really basic concepts. First of all, maintaining sente. Second of all, uh, we're, I'm going to give an easy way to uh, a certain point value. Um, and then finally, we're going to look for some common tricks to watch out for um, that, you know, might lose you a little more than a couple points in the end game if you're not careful. Okay. So let's move on to the first concept. And this first concept we're going to talk about is maintaining sente. OK, so to so this one's really easy to understand. Um, if you maintain sente, you get all the points. Um, and then you make all the points, reduce all the opponent's points, and you come out ahead with a net gain um, in points for yourself. So to look at this quick, quick example, let's say it's black to play first, right? Um, so black can play here. Oh, whoops. We're here, yes. So black can play here, and white has to block. Black has to block. White has to defend here, um, assuming all these outside liberties are filled on the fourth line. Um, if black plays here, suddenly this is a dead shape. Uh, white doesn't want that, so white has to protect. Okay, and then black comes out with of it with sente. Black can play here, white can play here, black, and then again, white has to defend, right? Because this is a dead shape. Um, oh, actually, that's a bad example because this is still a dead shape, and so black can play here. Um, but let's say white has another eye out here. <laughs> uh, the problem with contrived examples like this is sometimes I make mistakes, but yeah, black pokes in, um, then actually white doesn't need to defend here anymore because white has an eye. Um, but even in this case, black made a net gain of a couple points because black got to play all of these moves. Imagine now if it were the other way around and black or and white, excuse me, got to play these moves. So, you know, if white got to play here and then white got to play here, I'm um, excusing the fact that this is dead and this is dead again on the same side, huh? Um, <laughs> all that aside, if white gets to play those points and play all the senti moves, 
then white makes the net gain, um, and vice versa, as I just showed. If black plays those moves, then black makes the net gain. Um, and so back when I was, say, around 12Q, um, I named this the Sente Barrage, right? At the end of the game, if you go in and the opponent just um, silly mistake or carelessness plays a move that's absolutely gote, um, you can get a lot of moves uh, that are pretty sente, um, and you can make a large amount of points uh, just because you're playing moves that the opponent has to respond to over and over again. Um, so that's pretty easy to understand. Now, to reiterate something from the sente gote video, uh, sente is relative, and I think this is no more, nowhere else more apparent than in the end game because sente is basically defined by if I don't play here, I lose more points than playing somewhere elsewhere. So if you play a move and the follow-up isn't worth um, the opponent responding to, they might play a bigger move somewhere else first. So this all begs the question, how do you know how much a move is worth in the end game? So to answer that question, like all the other questions, I have another couple examples laid out on this board. Um, and here, we're hopefully going to be able to get a better idea of how to look at endgame points. So the first one we're looking at is on the center left, and we're going to talk about black playing here. Um, so first of all, it's important to say that uh, if we want to get specific in modern endgame theory, you know, this move is worth half a point, but that seems unnecessary, um, and I'm just trying to give a simple way to understand the concepts at first. So black to play if black plays here simply i'm going to say this point this move is worth one point why because if black plays here black had no points and then suddenly black makes one point so this move is a one point move it makes black one point um in this center example uh if we look at the same thing if black plays here uh black makes two points with that move because black has this point of territory but black also captured a prisoner and so that's an extra point so if we had these two positions on the board at the same time, it's the end game, they're the last two moves to play, and it's Black's turn. Black wants to play this move first. Black makes two points, and then white prevents just one point. Compare that to this, where black makes one point, but here, if, if white connects then, um, black has missed out on two points. So that's one point less optimal. Um, and you know, imagine going through this game later, after losing by a single point and you see, oh man, if only I had played here before I played here, then I could have won the game. Um, and again, you know, like these single point things add up over time and over the course of an endgame and can lead to very big point swings um, at the end of the game. Okay, so let's look at another example. Uh, on this right center side, uh, we have the symmetrical shape. And if it's black to play, where should black play? Um, this seems like it's really obvious, but let's get a little specific about it. So first of all, if black plays here, black makes two points. So we could call this a two-point move for black. However, if black plays here, uh, black makes four points. So this move is actually worth two times as much as this move up here. Um, and that's really big. Um, and even, actually, if black plays here and white plays this point, black can still make another point up top. And so in this sequence, black has made a total of five points with his moves. However, um, if black were to play here first and white saves these stones, black has only, uh, has only made two points. And so that's a three point difference um, just from this simple example between these two positions. You know, black has lost out the opportunity to make three points. Okay. So hopefully those are easy enough to understand. Next, we're going to look at a different position. So down here on the bottom, um, it's black to play. So we want to know how much this move is worth. And so if black plays here, um, this is pretty sente, even if you're comparing it to all the positions on the board. Um, let's say white decides to save these stones. Um, if black plays something like this, you know, the reduction here is worth way more than four points. So if we compare it to, um, let's call in, in an ideal position where it's like this, um, you know, white should get 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 points. Um, but if black plays here um, and white saves this, these stones on the right and then black plays out here, um, 
you know, even if we we're really conservative with what might happen like this, um, oh, whoops, you know, two, four, six, seven down from 15. So that's nearly like a six or seven point reduction compared to white saving, or I guess in net making four points. Um, and so now that we've established that the Hane here is Sente, white blocks, black plays, white has to defend this again. Um, if you fall in trick for this, I think every Go player has fallen for this at least once and then they never make the mistake again. Um, because if you don't, white or black can do this and the net and then these stones are in not a good shape and you've lost all your points. So white defense here. So this is a two point loss from that ideal position. Remember this one. So black makes this sequence in Sente and then black can go take the first biggest Gote point, which is this one. So that's how you do it. If this were an actual position um, on the board, for some reason, you know, you're looking at end game, imagine everything else is filled up. Black would wanna play this move first, it's the biggest move. Um, and actually it's the same for white, you know, if it's white's turn to play, white will wanna play these moves in Sente and then play the next biggest move. And for white, the next biggest move still is saving here. Okay. So that's just a quick survey on, um, on one way you can count point values um, and use that in your game. So uh, lastly, we're gonna look at a couple of things to be careful for um, when you're playing the end game. Um, and so the first one we're gonna look at is an extension of the connect and die um, shortage of liberties thing that we looked at um, back in the reading one video. I think it was. So that's in this bottom left. And if you're not paying attention and it's the final moves of the game, white might say, oh, look, I can Hane here in the corner and make a bunch of points. Um, but you have to be careful because if white decides to um, play this move, black blocks, but white can't connect, right? Because these, these four stones are in Atari. Um, and so black or, excuse me, white would have to play here and then black can take. Um, but you know, now there's a co, and then if black fills and wins that co, you know, black has made a free point for no reason, and white hasn't really made any headway into black's territory. Um, so this, it's hard to say it is an optimal result for white. Um, so white's best bet here is to push once, and then black blocks, and then white connects. Um, so yeah, be careful for the connect and die. Um, I think in this example, you don't actually, it looks like lose any points. Um, but you can imagine if you, know, you have a larger string or like this happens to be larger and you mess something up. Um, as I said, in the first time I, I talked about this concept, you can easily lose, you know, 10, 15 points just because uh, you weren't paying attention and decided to Hane instead of just extending one or connecting back. Okay, second thing we're gonna look for. Um, so here again on the left side, we're gonna look at times that you don't actually need to defend. And so this is where playing without reading can hurt you. So we looked at this earlier and if you've fallen for the trick before or you've just watched my video, you might say, oh, I need to defend this point, but do you really? Um, and it turns out you don't. So this happens to be a goatee move because even if white plays here, black is connected out um, and there's nothing for white to do with this single stone. Uh, and so um, it gets a little more tricky sometimes, maybe, you know, if it's a little further away, but you know, again, you have to read, you know, can white do anything here? Um, and then even if white tries to net, uh, this is the minimum distance where you can net black and connect out and these stones can't do anything. So this is not sente, the white to honey in um, is not a sente sequence. Definitely not so if black already has a stone here. Um, and so be careful here, you know, if 
it's White's turn to play, and White plays this thinking it's Sente, and you respond thinking that that was Sente. Um, suddenly, White has Sente to go play somewhere else, and you lose another point or two. Okay, third common pitfall we're going to look at. Um, uh, it's hard to call a pitfall. This is a Tetsuji that you should be aware of. Um, and so oftentimes on the first line, you can play this, um, and here Black would have to push in. Um, because if black plays here, uh, white has this nice double Atari thing going on. So don't always honey, but here we'd have this sequence um, and we play this, um, which is a perfectly fine result. You know, you've made headway in and black has lost uh, four ish points, it looks like, from white playing the honey. However, there is another move here that's very, very powerful. Um, and that is for white to clamp like this. Um, and so you might think, oh, you know, this is dumb. Black can just split these two stones apart. But then because of the weakness right above it, white can disconnect. And so um, at the very least, um, black can play this and then black would take um, and then black would have to play this again to stop white from coming in. Um, and then maybe white can come out. So this is, you know, a horrendous, horrendous result for black. Uh, white has completely managed to break into the territory at the end of the game. Um, and so, if I go back to that initial position here, um, first of all, if you're white and you see this, play it. <laughs> please, please play the clamp. Um, however, for black, it would be very pressing to defend. Um, even this one leaves Aji because if white plays out, Suddenly, you need to be careful that, um, you know, it might be a little tricky for something to happen depending on the surrounding area and what's going on. So, um, here, black's correct play would be here, but if white got the opportunity to play, the clamp is something to look for. Um, and basically, on any position, you should see if the clamp works. Um, and the last kind of thing to look out for um, ha is really similar to this position, but here on the bottom or the center and the bottom right position, I guess. Um, if it's white to play and white honey's inside, um, if black plays here, the same thing happens, right? So white can do this, and you might think this isn't even a big deal um, because. I don't know, you might think this is not a big deal. Um, but then white can play like this move and then this move because these top stones are weak. Now, even if black captures, um, white can Atari these stones and that's not a very fun result. Um, even the clamp works here um, because if black plays down, um, black, his three stones up here are just so weak you know, this doesn't work. And now black only has two liberties and that's not fun. Um, so yeah, when you see these bent two and bent three positions or not bent, but um, strings of two or three where your opponent has surrounded you, um, you, need, you need to be really, really careful about what you play. Um, and so here, um, if it's black to play, can black play here? Yeah, I think black can play here at first, but then um, if white plays here, then black needs to defend. Um, and try to read that out for yourself. Um, why can, or maybe I'm wrong, and why can't white um, do anything inside here at this moment? But yeah, here, this is a very, very weak shape. Um, lots of exploitable cuts. Um, this might be what we call Aji. So if you hear that term thrown around, Aji um, is kind of like a bad, bad, uh, bad juju, bad vibes, <laughs> things that your opponent can exploit um, in the future. Um, so yeah, those are some common tricks to watch out for in the end game. So again, going over them real quick on the bottom left, the connect and die, watch out for that. I'm um, here on the middle. Don't always think that you need to respond to this honey, so um, yeah, this sequence, black can play away because white can't cut here. Um, here on the center right, white can clamp. Clamping is something you should always read out and see if it works. And then here on the center, 
bottom. Um, black is just really, really weak here. Um, and so white, as white, if I were playing, I would have a field day with this. This is a huge end game reduction. Okay, so uh, that was a kind of a quick and dirty overview of the end game and some things that will hopefully help you out um, not lose one games. Or maybe, you know, if you're behind and your opponent is really, really bad at endgame and doesn't know anything, maybe you can even win um, games where you are behind because you play all those senti moves um, and, and come back for the win. All right, so thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. Um, again, sorry it's out of order, but I'll, I'm trying to make those middle game videos um, a little bit more thorough and hopefully really interesting for y'all. Okay. So with that, I'll see you next time and Stonefly out.